Greetings, motherfuckers. My name is Samuel, and today I shall be impart onto you the good news because today's topic is the potential minefield that is Christianity. If you're watching this video, you're probably, or maybe not, you may just be morbidly interested, accustomed to the basics of this ancient religion Jesus is Lord, the Pope is Catholic, etc., etc. But what else do you know and not know about Jesus' official fan club? For instance, what frankly horrifying thing did Pope Stephen VI do in the 9th century? Spoiler alert, no, not that. What happens in the shocking tale of Touchdown Jesus? And why isn't Stanley a saint yet? He created Marvel, for goodness sake! Ugh, well, two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so put on your Sunday best, don't eat fish on Fridays, for some reason, that's a really weird rule, and prepare to be saved from boredom as we count through 101 facts about Christianity. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer on a couple of points. Number one, as we like to stay on brand, there are jokes in this video while talking about this topic. If you think that may offend you, feel free to watch another one of our videos instead. And point two, this video isn't us telling you what to believe in. We're not presenting it as the correct religion or saying that any at all is for that matter. Believe or not believe in whatever you want. Number one, in case you haven't been, well, I don't know, outside or ever spoken to anybody or listen to TV or anything like that, Christianity is a monotheistic Abrahamic religion based on the life and teachings of the big man upstairs who came downstairs for a bit. Adherents of Christianity, known as Christians, believe Jesus is the son of God and the saviour of all humanity. And this whole thing has gotten pretty popular over the years. Number two. Christianity began in the first century as a small Jewish sect in Jerusalem, in the Roman province of Judea. Through the efforts and activities of disciples and followers, the early Christian movement grew, moving northward and westward within the Mediterranean region, which I hear is lovely this time of year. Number three. The religion of Christianity is based upon traditional Christian scripture, community creedal statements, and the non-canonized historical writings of the Christian church fathers. The Christian holy book is known as the Bible. Oh, sorry, no, Bible. There you go. Which comes from the Greek word biblion, meaning paper or scroll. The Bible consists of the Old Testament, in which Jesus' arrival on earth as the Messiah or Christ is prophesied, and the New Testament, the sequel in which it actually happens, plot twist, and the life and teachings of this Jesus guy are chronicled. Number four. Early Christianity taught that Jesus of Nazareth was and is the literal son of God who fulfilled ancient Jewish prophecies of a coming Messiah who would set God's people free from bondage, not that kind, following his incarnation as a sinless human being. As such, Jesus became the perfect sacrifice to reconcile all of humanity to Yahweh, the Jewish creator of God, which was nice of him, I suppose. Number five. However, not everyone was super on board with the new religious movement that would ultimately develop into Christianity. The teachings and activities of Jesus and his followers led to controversy and conflict with both members of the Jewish community and the ruling Roman powers of the region. Eventually, Jesus was arrested, tried, and convicted of treason in the Roman court under Pontius Pilate, apparently under pressure from Jewish leaders who accused him of blasphemy. Awkward. Number six. Jesus was ultimately crucified for his supposed crimes, which, if you didn't know, that means he was nailed through his hands and feet to a large wooden cross by Roman soldiers and left to die. It's this fairly gruesome form of execution that led to the cross becoming the most widely used symbol of the Christian religion. Number seven. When it comes to the historicity of Jesus, as a word, there is an overwhelming academic consensus that Jesus did indeed exist in some form. Within only a few decades of his supposed lifetime, Jesus is mentioned extensively by Jewish and Roman historians, such that his supposed existence is all but certain by the standards of modern historical investigation. Number eight. As the number of professed Christians rose, the Jewish leaders who had earlier been threatened by the teachings of Jesus became worried that Jesus was super cool and also maybe the literal son of God movement could reignite, and so turned their scorn and persecutions to his disciples and followers. This prompted many of these early Christians to flee to safer, more receptive areas. Number nine. Still, many early Christians decided to stay in Jerusalem and Judea to speak their message of their faith, which led to public abuse by authorities who were determined to extinguish it. The conflict that arose eventually escalated to serious violence, and in the year 34, the man later canonized as Saint Stephen was stoned to death by the Jewish authorities, becoming the first recorded martyr of the Christian faith. Number 10. Many other Christians were martyred following the death of St. Stephen, though. The disciple Andrew was himself crucified, but on a wooden X rather than a cross, supposedly at his own request, deeming himself to be unworthy to be crucified on the same type of cross as Jesus. The leader of the disciples, Peter, who was martyred in Rome under Emperor Nero, was also crucified, but shockingly enough, upside down, as he also felt unworthy to be nailed to wood in the same way as Jesus was. Number 11. Other Christian martyrs, such as Paul, Matthias, and James, son of Zebedee, were beheaded for their commitment to their faith. Matthias in particular was stoned first and then beheaded, so yeah, he had a bad day. Number 12. 
Other early martyrs died in conspicuously less standard circumstances, shall we say. The Gospel writer John the Evangelist was said to have been dragged to death by horses through the streets of an Egyptian city until his body was torn to pieces. Lovely. While James the Just was clubbed to death after having somehow survived being thrown from the top of a temple. Tough break. Number 13. As early Christianity developed throughout the second century, persecution mostly came from Roman leadership, who exploited the passivity of early Christians, using them as political targets and convenient scapegoats for a wide variety of social ills. Number 14. Although not every Roman emperor targeted Christians, several rulers are notable for their cruelty and brutality towards them. Nero, known as a capricious and tyrannical emperor who reigned from 54 CE to 68 CE, often targeted Christians as a distraction from his failings as a leader, having Christians set on fire or torn apart by dogs. Number 15. However, perhaps the biggest Roman oppressor of the Christians was Emperor Diocletian, who reigned from 284 to 305 CE, and believed that the declining power of the Roman Empire was more the fault of Christianity than poor governorship. As such, he levied severe persecution against Christians, essentially banning the religion by forbidding Christian worship, blocking adherents from holding political office, destroying Christian churches, and burning scriptures and Bibles. Despite all this, however, the Christian movement survived and grew even stronger. Number 16. However, the idea that the Flavian Amphitheatre, aka the Mother Effing Colosseum, was the site of the mass martyring of Christians is likely not to be true. There is little evidence that Christians were executed inside the Colosseum specifically for being Christian. We do know, however, that Christians were killed in other locations, such as the Circus of Nero, which was situated not far from the present day Basilica of St. Peter. Number 17. In the year 301, Armenia became the very first nation to adopt Christianity as its state religion. The Armenian Apostolic Church, of which over 90% of Armenia's 3.1 million people are adherents, was founded even earlier in the first century. Damn history, you old. Number 18. By the 4th century, Christianity dominated all other religions in Greco-Roman society and spread throughout the Roman Empire. This took the still young religion as far north as ancient Britain and possibly as far east as India. Number 19. As the Christian movement continued to develop, leaders in the burgeoning religion laboured to preserve the authentic message of Jesus and his disciples, attempting to maintain the integrity of Christ's teachings by rejecting substantiated myth or incongruent teachings concerning theology on God and Jesus. Well, they tried to at least. Number 20. Followers of the early Christian faith developed short summaries of their faith, which have since become known as creeds. The earliest of the main creeds used in Christianity today is probably the Apostles' Creed. No, Apostles' Creed, not Assassin's There we go. Believed by some to have first been formulated by Christ's 12 primary disciples, known as the Apostles, under inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Written into its standard form in the following centuries, the Apostles' Creed is a simple statement of faith that affirms belief in the story of Jesus and fundamental Christian teachings. Number 21. In the coming centuries, the early Christian movement convened to define their beliefs and solidify the mainstream interpretation of Christianity. Thus, the major doctrines of Christianity were established by ecumenical councils from all over the Mediterranean region, using scripture as a handy guide. The first Council of Nicaea, held in 325 CE, agreed upon the nature of Jesus by rejecting Arianism. Oh god, no, not that one. But rather a perspective which asserted that Jesus was subordinate to God. Number 22. Numerous other interpretations of Christianity were rejected by mainstream Christian leaders and are now today widely considered heretical. Docetism promoted the idea that the physical body of Jesus was not material in nature but merely an illusion, as he was only spirit and never truly incarnated. Yeah, no, people didn't like that one bit. Number 23. The doctrine of Nestorianism held that Jesus existed as two separate people, human and divine, and therefore rejects the mainstream Christian perspective of the hypostatic union, which holds that the human and divine natures of Christ exist as one in Jesus. Nestorianism also promoted the idea that, in some sense, Mary only gave birth to Jesus the human, and so she therefore could not be considered the mother of God. Much heretical, very blasphemy. Number 24. Another largely rejected doctrine, since we're having so much fun talking about it, promoted the idea that Adam's original sin did not taint humanity and therefore human beings are capable of realising salvation by choosing good or evil without special divine aid. Again, most mainstream interpretations of Christianity disagree, so yeah, that one had to go too. Number 25. Eventually, the mainstream Christian movement solidified the supernatural relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, sorry, that, I did that out of force of habit. Which eventually came to be known as the Trinity, meaning threefold. Specifically, these early church leaders concluded that God exists as a single deity with three separate but permanently connected entities. Thanks for clearing that up, everyone, because otherwise it'd be confusing, right? Number 26. It was around this time in the early 4th century that the oldest surviving copy of a complete Bible was created, known as the Codex Vaticanus. The ancient manuscript which is preserved in the Vatican Library consists of 759 leaves of vellum in unsealed letters, and features a three-column format without word division, punctuation, or page numbers. So, yeah, sounds like a great read. 
Number 27. Eventually, the persecution of the early Christians in Roman society finally came to an end under Constantine I. Or the first, rather. <laughs> one. <laughs> also arrogantly known as Constantine the Great, who ruled between 306 CE and 337 CE. Constantine was sympathetic to the Christian movement and, once in power, reversed many of the former legal restrictions on Christianity and even returned much of the property that had been confiscated under Diocletian. Number 28. Constantine I eventually converted to Christianity on his deathbed. <laughs> wow, hedging his bets, becoming the first Roman emperor to do so. His conversion may have been preceded by Marcus Julius Philippus, also known by his charming nickname of Philip the Arab, who was rumoured to have converted to Christianity, but this has never been confirmed. Number 29. On the 27th of February 380, the Edict of Thessalonica was issued, making Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire, allowing for a dramatic change in how the faith manifested in wider society. Christianity shifted from a loose informal structure to stricter organisation, from individual worship to public community worship. Number 30. As things get bigger, you need to find ways to organise them, like my laminated photos of Jennifer Lawrence, which are categorised by emotion. And that's exactly what happened to Christianity. Well, sort of. Over the next two centuries, the Christian faith would see the development of the religious aristocracy, the laity, the clergy, the episcopacy, i.e. the role of governance by bishops, and the papacy. Number 31. Interestingly, where riches were previously viewed as a sign of greed and exploitation owing to the association with the emperor, over the subsequent centuries, mainstream Christianity became more tolerant of the accumulation of wealth, viewing it in a more favourable light. Hmm, funny that, isn't it? Number 32. An even greater shift in attitude saw Christian belief change from pacifism to militarism, as Christians found themselves in possession of greater power. Remember, with great power comes gr Oh, you're not in the mood for a Spider-Man reference. Okay then, moving on. Number 33. Theologically, there was also a move away from millennialism, not that kind of millennial, and a potential second coming of Christ to a more pragmatic, earthly perspective on life, as well as the enforcement of clerical abstinence and the condemnation of simony, which is the act of selling church offices and roles or spiritual privileges in general. Number 34. Around the year 500, St. Benedict wrote what would ultimately become known as the Rule of St. Benedict, a book of precepts for monks living communally in monasteries under the authority of an abbot. Monasticism would become a powerful force in Europe, giving rise to many centres of learning, most famously in Ireland, Scotland and Gaul, which is the old fancy word for France. Number 35. Indeed, from the 11th century onward, older cathedral schools developed into universities, such as the University of Oxford, University of Paris and the University of Bologna. Originally, these institutions taught only theology, but eventually expanded their range of subjects to include things like medicine, philosophy and law, becoming the direct ancestors of modern Western institutions of learning. Number 36. The Middle Ages came along and also brought about major changes within Christianity too. In the early 8th century, the Byzantine Emperor Leo III demanded that images in worship places be removed, after claiming that the veneration of statues, pictures and icons was idolatry. In 787, those guys, known as the Second Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, ruled that the veneration of images directed worship at the entity being represented, not the image itself, which is kind of obvious. Why did Leo need to be told that? Number 37. The addition of the fancy new but also historically very old concept of purgatory was also established around this time in the 11th century. They were always coming up with new ideas, weren't they? Purgatory is a supposed intermediate state following death in which those destined for heaven are subject to a final purification. Sort of like washing fruit before you eat it. I mean, not like that, and also I don't know that because I hate fruit, but a little bit like that. Sort of. Kinda. You know what I mean. Number 38. In the year 897, Pope Stephen VI accused the former Pope, Famosus, of perjury and having ascended to the papacy illegally. So he brought him to trial and ultimately found him guilty and had all his acts and orders annulled and declared invalid. This would have been sensational enough, but in addition to his supposed crimes, Famosus had died several months earlier in August of 896. That's right, Pope Stephen VI had the rotting corpse of Famosus exhumed, clad in papal vestments and propped up in a throne to face trial which became known as the Cadaver Synod. Good gr- saw your life out, Steve. Number 39. For hundreds of years between the 7th to 13th century, the Christian Church underwent a significant gradual alienation between the Latin or Western Christian branch, also known as the Catholic Church, and an Eastern largely Greek branch, the Orthodox Church. The two branches disagreed on a number of administrative, liturgical and theological issues, such as papal primacy of jurisdiction, clerical celibacy, and the use of unleavened bread in the Eucharist. Number 40. These differences eventually proved too great, and in 1054, the Western and Eastern Church split, resulting in a schism known today as the East-West Schism, or sometimes the Great Schism. Despite several attempts to reconcile the two branches in the following centuries, the Eastern Orthodox Church remains separate from the Catholic Church to this very day. Number 41. By the end of the 11th century, approximately two-thirds of the ancient Christian world had been conquered by Muslims, including important regions such as Palestine, Syria, Egypt, and Anatolia. As you can imagine, the leaders of Christianity were not super jazzed about this, and in their point of view, something had to be done. Something like... The meaning of life. <laughs> 
Not that, that's just the uh, number intro. The Crusade! <laughs> Between the 11th and 13th centuries, many Christians fought in a series of religious wars known as the Crusades, which had been sanctioned by the church who took back control of the Holy Land from Muslim rule. Alongside several smaller efforts, most experts recognize about nine major Crusades, the first of which was initiated by Pope Urban II, the coolest pope of all, in response to pleas for aid against Turkish expansion by the Byzantine Emperor Alexios I. Number 43. Estimates of total deaths as a result of the Crusades vary wildly. Some experts put the number as low as 1 million, whereas others suggest that as many as 9 could have been killed. Million, I mean. Boo, Crusades. Number 44. Despite initial success, the Crusades ultimately failed, with Christian forces failing to retake control of the Holy Land. However, many argue that the wars did result in some positive outcomes for the Christian world, which was expanded geographically and graduated to a higher level of trade. So, yay for the Crusades? Yeah, no, maybe not. Number 45. <laughs> Starting in 1266 CE, the hugely influential Christian theologian and philosopher Thomas Aquinas wrote his best known work, the Summa Theologica, on which he worked until his death in 1274, leaving it unfinished. Lazy Thomas. Written as an instructional guide for theology students, the Summa Theologica is a compendium of the main theological teachings of the Catholic Church and is today regarded as one of the most influential works of Western literature. Number 46. As most medieval Europeans were illiterate, gargoyles were invented to serve as visual reminders of hell to get them into church, by emphasizing the idea that evil dwelt outside the church while salvation dwelt within it. Number 47. Before his ascension to papacy, that means becoming the Pope, by the way, in 1458, Pope Pius II wrote a popular erotic book called The Tale of Two Lovers, which became one of the best selling books of the 15th century. I can't imagine how erotic it is by today's standards, but I'm sure back then it ruffled a few ruffs. Number 48. Towards the end of the 15th century, Western Christianity was invigorated by the discovery of North America by Christopher Columbus in 1492. Though we should point out that millions of Native Americans were already living there at the time, and the Vikings had already visited the continent hundreds of years prior, but decided to keep that on the lowdown for some reason. Anyway, the kinda but not really discovery of North America prompted a new wave of missionary activity intent on converting indigenous peoples, which coincided nicely with the burgeoning colonial expansion of the European powers, spreading Christianity to the Americas, Oceania, East Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Yikes. Number 49. The 16th century saw the beginning of the Renaissance, and with it everyone's favourite Christian schism, the Reformation. This happened in 1517 when a German theological professor named Martin Luther protested against several Catholic doctrines, particularly the sale of indulgences. Number 50. Luther's objections, along with the work of other dissenters like Huldrych Zwingli and John Calvin, developed into the major Christian movement called Protestantism, which said, uh uh, no way to the primacy of the Pope, the role of tradition, and other doctrines and practices. Number 51. The divides caused by the Reformation sparked outbreaks of religious violence. Oh, there's a surprise. And the establishment of separate state churches throughout Europe. Lutheranism spread into northern, central, and eastern parts of present day Germany and Scandinavia. Arminism gained followers in the Netherlands and Frisia. And Calvinism and its related forms, such as Presbyterianism, were introduced in Scotland, the Netherlands, Hungary, Switzerland, and France. Number 52. The Reformation in England began in 1534, a bit later, when King Henry VIII declared himself head of the Church of England to justify his divorce from his first wife Catherine of Aragon. Hashtag legend, hashtag lads on tour. Beginning in 1536, Henry had the monasteries throughout England, Wales and Ireland dissolved, confiscating their land and treasures. Number 34, what? Number 53. Eventually, the differences in opinion within Western Christianity led to numerous major altercations. Prominent examples include the French Wars of Religion, which constituted a 36-year-long period of war and popular unrest between Roman Catholics and Calvinist Protestants, known as Huguenots in the Kingdom of France. Between 1562 and 98, as many as 3 million people died in the conflict, making it the second deadliest religious war in history of Europe, surpassed only by... Number 54. The Thirty Years' War, which pitted Protestants against Catholics in a bitter conflict which lasted almost exactly three decades, between 1618 and 48. Roughly 8 million people were killed throughout Europe as a result of not only warfare but famine and disease. So, it's not looking good, is it, at the moment? Number 55. 1611 saw the publication of the King James Version of the Bible. Created for the Church of England under the sponsorship of King James I, this version of the Christian Holy Book was generally accepted as the standard English Bible from the middle of the 17th century to the early 1900s. Number 56. The following centuries posed a considerable challenge to Christianity, as stuff like scientific and philosophical developments in the form of the Scientific Revolution and the Age of Enlightenment prompted increased questioning of religious orthodoxy. Christianity was confronted with various forms of scepticism, as well as an emphasis on individual liberty and the rise of several modern political ideologies, such as early versions of socialism and liberalism. Number 57. 
In March of 1830, an American man named Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon, which he claimed was a translation of sacred texts engraved onto golden plates that constituted another testament of the Bible. How exciting. Smith asserted that he found the plates buried in a hill near his home, the location of which had been revealed to him by an angel called Maroney, who told him he was not allowed to show them to anyone. Yeah, 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 I know. Number 58. Despite the presence of what one might delicately call questionable aspects of Smith's story, the movement became known as Mormonism and has since evolved into a major, if slightly quirky, Christian tradition, the largest denomination of which is the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints, which boasts roughly 15 million members. There's also a musical about them too, which is nice, I guess. But famous Mormons include Brandon Flowers from The Killers, Twilight author Stephanie Meyer, and prominent Republican politician Mitt Romney. Number 59. Another non-traditional Christian denomination are the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is by far the largest group to emerge from the Bible student movement founded by Charles Taze Russell in the late 1870s. Jehovah's Witnesses reject the mainstream concepts such as the Trinity and the inherent immortality of the soul, and are well known for their door-to-door -door preaching, refusing blood transfusions, and for not celebrating Christmas, Easter, or birthdays. They also believe that Jesus died after being nailed to a single upright stake, rather than a traditional wooden cross. <laughs> Those guys. Number 60. In the 14-year period between 1850 and 1864, China was ravaged by civil war in the form of the Taiping Rebellion, in which the power of the Qing dynasty was challenged by the forces of a Christian convert called Hong Chuquan, who believed himself to be the brother of Jesus Christ. The brother? That was a delayed birth? This uh, didn't go down too well, and low estimates of the number of people who died in the conflict start at 20 million. That's the low estimate, and they start at 20. Number 61. Point 24 on the bad guys of the Second World War's 25-point plan I can't really say their name because we'll get them monetized. Introduced their concept of positive Christianity, a twisted interpretation of the religion that sought to merge German Christian identity with their beliefs. In 1937, Hans Kerl, the Minister for Church Affairs, explained that positive Christianity was not dependent upon the Apostles' Creed, nor on faith in Christ as the Son of God, which is at once mightily presumptuous and racistly convenient given the thousands of years of Christian worship which say pretty much the exact opposite. Number 62. This different version of Christianity also denied the Jewish origins of Christ. Surprise, surprise. Even going so far as to state that Jesus himself was an Aryan hero and not a Jew, which is literally historically incorrect. Oh, they're really the worst. Number 63. 1948 saw the formation of the World Council of Churches, a worldwide interchurch organization which aims to promote unity between the various Christian denominations. Good luck with that one. Members of the organization include the Assyrian Church of the East, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, most jurisdictions of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and most mainline Protestant churches, which collectively represent as many as 590 million people around the world in 150 countries. The Catholic Church is notably not a member, though it does send observers to meetings, so make of that what you will. Nintendo 64. In 1955, a Dutch missionary known as Brother Andrew founded Open Doors, a charitable organization that supports persecuted Christians around the world. In 2018, the group released its annual World Watch List, which found that Christians in nine countries around the world experience extreme persecution, while Christians face a very high degree of persecution in a further 16 nations. Number 65. Until 1966, the Catholic Church had a banned list of books, known as Index Librorium Prohibitorum, which listed publications deemed heretical or contrary to morality, which Catholics were forbidden to read. The list included works like Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, and, weirdly, Victor Hugo's famous novel Les Miserables. Why was that in- what? Number 66. 359 years after forcing Galileo Galilei to recant his support for the very true theory that the Earth orbits around the Sun, the Catholic Church then decided he was right in 1992. It took them until the early 90s to admit that the Earth moves around the Sun. Christ. Oh, sorry, Jesus. Number 67. In 2001, Pope John Paul II entered and prayed in the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Syria, in order to improve relations with Islam, and in doing so became the very first Catholic Pope to enter and pray inside a mosque. He even kissed a copy of the Quran, an act that was questioned by many Catholics but made him very popular among Muslims. Ah, unity. Good. Number 68. The estimated cost of all the funeral events held following the death of Pope John Paul II in 2005 amounted to around $12 million. It's a fancy funeral right there, but we can beat it, right guys, when I eventually go. Oh, I'm all sad now. Number 69. Celibacy. Shouldn't be doing that, sorry. The riches held by the Catholic Church are hardly a secret. In 2010, the Catholic Church reported an income of $97 billion. And to think they spend most of it on bling. Number 17. People still say bling, right? In 2013, Pope Benedict XVI resigned, becoming the first Pope to do so since Gregory XII in 1415, almost 600 years earlier. Pope Benedict was succeeded by Pope Francis, who at the time of making this video is the current Pope. If you're from the future and Francis isn't the Pope anymore, please let us know in the comments. I know you want to. Number 71. 
Prior to becoming the most senior Catholic on the face of the planet, Pope Francis once worked as a bouncer at a bar in his hometown of Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. Wow, okay, won't mess with him then. Number 72. Today, Christianity is the world's largest religion, with over 2.3 billion adherents, who vary wildly in their commitment to the faith from the kinda sorta Christian all the way up to Stephen Baldwin. Number 73. In 2001, the World Christian Encyclopedia counted 33,830 different Christian denominations, which has likely risen in the years since. By far the largest of all these is the Roman Catholic Church, of which roughly half of all Christians are members. Crazy to think that only one of these denominations is correct, eh? Choose wisely, guys. Number 74. As a result of Christianity's historical dominance, approximately a little under a third of the global population, 31.2% to be precise, identify as Christian, according to a Pew estimate from 2015. Number 75. However, commitment to Christianity declined significantly in Europe as modernity and secularism rose throughout the 20th century. Though adherence to Christianity has remained relatively high in the United States, hello, I know you're watching, the number of Christians as a percentage of the American population is also declining. This can probably be credited to the rise of atheism, a perceived decrease in relevance to the modern world, various major scandals of morality, and disagreement with traditional Christian views on things like abortion, civil rights, and not being horrible to women and gay people. You know, stuff like that. Not saying every Christian is, but, you know, some of them, come on guys. Number 76. At current rates, experts expect that Islam will overtake Christianity as the world's most popular religion in the year 2070. Number 77. The late 20th century and early 21st century have shown a shift of Christian adherence towards the Africa and Southern Hemisphere in general, with the West no longer the main standard bearer of the Christian religion. Number 78. It's believed that by 2050, slightly under 40% of all Christians will reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. Number 79. For an idea of how Christianity has declined in Europe, 70% of young people in the UK, that's anyone under 30, consider themselves not to have a religion. The highest instance in Europe of this is 91% of young people in the Czech Republic. Number 80. In 2004, a 4,000 member plus Christian megachurch named Solid Rock Church completed the construction of a 19 meter styrofoam and fiberglass statue of Jesus named King of Kings. Located near the city of Monroe in southwestern Ohio, the monument's appearance elicited several mostly affectionate nicknames. The position of his arms, raised towards the sky, earned it the name of Touchdown Jesus, while its slightly yellow colour led many to refer to the figure as Big Butter Jesus. Number 81. However, in June of 2013, the statue was lost to the no-doubt captivating Monroe skyline in spectacular fashion, when it was hit by lightning and destroyed by the subsequent fire. Only the internal metal frame left following the blaze, the ruined statue was quickly renamed Terminator Jesus. Number 82. Not to worry, however, Christ has indeed risen again in Monroe, as in 2012, the Solid Rock Church finished the construction of a second Christ statue, which stands where the previous monument was so violently annihilated. Titled Lex Mundi, meaning Light of the World, the statue features a completely different design, is built with fire-resistant materials, and understandably includes a lightning suppression system. The statue's pose has led to another ingenious sobriquet, Hug Me Jesus. Number 83. Hey, here's a thing. Hatred for, opposition to, or perhaps even genuine fear of the Pope is known as papaphobia. There really is a word for everything. Papaphobia bless. Number 84. There's a Christian church in San Francisco that worships the American jazz saxophonist and composer John Coltrane as a saint. Founded in 1971, the St. John Coltrane Church was created by Franzo and Marina King, who claimed to have been inspired by a 1965 Coltrane concert at which Franzo felt the presence of God. Number 85. There are a total of eight Christian churches scattered throughout the planet's southernmost continent of Antarctica. Four of these are Catholic, three are Eastern Orthodox, and one is specifically non-denominational. All of them freezing, though. Number 86. Seriously, bring nipple plasters. There is a Christian sect in China known as Eastern Lightning, or the Church of Almighty God, that believes Jesus is currently living as a Chinese woman named Yang Jiangbin, who is the wife of the group's founder, Zhao Wishan. After establishing the group in the early 90s, the couple fled to the United States, where they were granted political asylum, and today, they direct the movement from New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of. Number 87. Contrary to the beliefs of biblical literalists, the Catholic Church holds no official position on the theory of evolution, though various leaders have made statements affirming its validity. In late 2014, for example, Pope Francis stated that God created human beings and let them develop according to the internal laws that he has given to each one, so they would reach their fulfillment. That being said though, Pope Francis did declare that evolution and the Big Bang Theory are real and God is not a magician with a magic wand, so who knows who to believe. Number 88. Not only that, the Vatican's chief astronomer, Reverend George Coyne, has also stated that intelligent design isn't science even though it pretends to be. <laughs> Number 89. 
The holiest site in Christianity is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which was built on the traditionally accepted site of Christ's crucifixion and burial. The keys to the church are held by a Muslim family that opens the church every morning, an arrangement that's been in place since 1187 as a result of a deal made by Saladin to protect it from being destroyed by his fellow Muslims. The current key holder, Adib Jawad Joder al Husseini, says he is proud to have the job. Number 90. There is a pilgrimage site in Sri Lanka that's known for the Sri Pada, meaning sacred footprint, a 1.8 meter rock formation near the summit considered to be the footprint of the Buddha in Buddhism, as well as the footprint of Shiva in Hinduism and the footprint of Adam in Islam and Christianity. As such, the site is sacred to all four religions. Number 91. Today, around 7-10% of Arabs are Christians. The largest Christian group in the Middle East are the Egyptian Copts, who number around 15 to 20 million people. Number 92. When it comes to interesting and very large churches, the Monastery of St. Simon, located in the Mokotan Mountain in southeastern Cairo, Egypt, is certainly worth a look in. The monastery is also known as the Cave Church, because, well, it's literally built into the cliffs using a large pre-existing cave and smaller man-made caves, with a total capacity of 20,000 people. Number 93. Despite the fact that a belief in God is generally inessential to be a Christian, there are those who refuse to let such a minor detail void their Christian identity. Christian atheists, for example, view Jesus as a philosopher and humanitarian, while rejecting the supernatural claims central to mainstream Christianity. I mean, sure, go ahead, live your lives. Number 94. Only half of American Christians can name the four Gospels, you know, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, that were, you know, written between 70 and 100 CE and are the main source of information on the life of Jesus. No? Nothing? Christ. Oh, sorry. A again. Number 95. Since the 1950s, some devout Catholics in the Philippines mark Good Friday, the Christian holiday commemorating the crucifixion and death of Jesus, by reenacting the crucifixion. For real. Actual nails are hammered into the hands and feet of the most committed penitents, who are held in position on large wooden crosses for several minutes before being brought down. Thousands of others engage in self-flagellation in a bloody display of devotion for Jesus. I'm gonna give that a miss this year, boys, but you guys have fun. Number 96. Until the 26th of March 2015, it was illegal for the British monarch to be Catholic. The Succession to the Crown Act 2013 removed the stipulation, but the requirement that the monarch be Protestant remains, as the British monarch is also the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Number 97. In addition to being a literal astronaut, Buzz Aldrin was also an elder at Webster Presbyterian Church, and before he rocketed into space in 1969, he received special permission to take bread and wine with him in order to give himself communion while on the moon. Commun Number 98. Communion. Commun Most people have at least heard of the more popular saints, such as St. Joseph and St. Patrick and St. Nicholas, but there are some slightly more obscure saints recognised in various denominations. For instance, St. Julian, the Hospitaller, is the Catholic Church's patron saint of circus workers, clowns, jugglers, fiddle players, and bizarrely, murderers. <laughs> okay. Number 99. St. Drogo is another strange saint, as he is the Catholic Church's patron saint of cattle, coffee house owners, deaf people, those whom others find repulsive and ugly people. My god, I mean, wow, that's harsh on deaf people. Mind you, they'll never hear it, will they? Number 100. St. Clara of Assisi is the Catholic Church's patron saint of television, based on the claim that on one Christmas Eve, she was too sick to attend church, and so God granted her a miraculous vision, allowing her to see the Mass, despite being far away from where it was happening. Number 101. Statistically speaking, the odds of any given person becoming a saint are roughly 1 in 20 million, which is incidentally the same odds that I will get married to the transcendent being of pure light that is Jennifer Lawrence. I stayed up all night and crunched the numbers. Frankly, I like those odds. So that was 101 Facts About Christianity. A slightly different video to usual, sure, but if you learn anything new, let us know in the comments down below. Give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already, because it's what all the- it's the new religion, basically. Maybe that's offensive. Oh well. In the meantime, though, hey, look at these two videos on screen. You're, you lucky pup. You're gonna have a great time with one of them. You have to choose which, though. You need to do so now. Bye.